Hello guys, long time no see. I had to take a pause from YouTube because I was on vacation and then I got sick and all that stuff piled up, but now I'm back and feel motivated to keep them videos coming. In this video I'm going to show and tell how I made probably one of the most detailed dolls in my career and it's a doll of Vash the Stampede from the anime Trigon. I'm going to Frankenstein this doll out of several Monster High boys and I replaced one of the arms with grey because Vash has a prosthetic arm in this greenish teal color and if you are also repainting dolls or maybe following this type of content a lot, you probably know that survivability of paint on joints is not excellent, so I'm always trying to choose a base that has less contrast with the color I want to achieve in the end. Long story short, if paint chips off, grey won't be as noticeable on turquoise as blush. Of course I'm going to use the strongest paint I have for the joints, but I still can't guarantee that it will survive forever, because it will depend on many factors I can't control. Some doll collectors like myself prefer to put their dolls on the shelf, but some people like to interact with their dolls, like pose them, do photo shoots, change clothes and so on. And obviously, if the joints are in use, they will be wearing out faster. So right now I am trying to minimize the possible damage if it happens to occur. In the anime his arm is removable, and so it will be in my figurine, so I am going to implant a magnet in it. After I was done with replacing his arm, I also sketched all the scars and metal implants on his body. According to the backstory of Bash, his body is covered in scars, stitch marks and in general looks like patchwork because he participated in so many fights, and yet he was refusing to kill even the most brutal and violent of his opponents, who were not as merciful as Bash. So even though these details won't be visible under his clothes, I think it's still important to keep them because it's one of the features that represent his personality the most. And also because I'm a sucker for details, of course. Next up is his head. I need to change the shape of his ears, make the hairline smoother and I think it would be good to reduce the width of his forehead a bit. Unfortunately right now this guy is a bit too soft to work with, so we need to give him a hand and shrink this head in acetone of course. I wanted the head to become a bit harder, but I didn't want it to lose much in size, so I only left it in acetone solution for 24 hours. Acetone also bleached it a bit, which is also helpful for my future manipulations with his skin tone. I also make sure to prepare a hole for the piercing before I start painting the face, to not damage the paint later on. Good planning for the win. Now I need to re-sculpt his ears and he will be ready for rerouting.
I'm going to reroute the blonde part of his hair with yarn because I think yarn is the best choice for short hairstyles. Not just because it's soft and easy to style, but because acrylic fibers are much thinner, which makes the hair look fuller as well, so if we cut it short, we are less likely to see the scalp through it. Together with my customer, we chose this pastel yellow yarn because this color looks like it does in the anime and it's also quite close to the actual blonde hair, so the character won't look too cartoonish. I protect his hair with plastic and now he's ready for the face up. I put his head back on his body before starting the face up this time because after shrinking heads become more challenging to fit back on and especially if you are changing the skin tone, paint might chip off around the neck hole. It's not too bad if you use one of the primary colors, but if it's a special mix it would be quite hard to mix matching color to fix the damages. So I decided that it's better to be safe than sorry in this case. In my first face up attempt I wanted to change his skin tone with just pastels, so I started off with a layer of purple pastels to calm down that yellow, but then I noticed that it makes all the micro scratches from sandpaper pop more, so I was afraid that it wouldn't let me create an even skin tone and I switched to acrylics. While mixing the paint, I kept comparing it to the skin color of his arm. I want the color to match, but be slightly lighter than the body, because acrylics always get darker as they dry. I think it looks close enough now. Let's start sketching! Unfortunately, I was not familiar with the franchise before I got this commission, so it was really difficult for me to plan his face up. My task now is to make a face that looks almost nothing like Vash look like Vash, but all I knew about him was pictures from the internet. And while looking at them, I saw his face features like blue eyes and the birthmark, but I couldn't figure out how to show his personality through the face up. Like sure, I could take these features and draw them over the base mode I have, but would he look like Vash then? All anime characters have pretty limited face digitalization compared to real humans, but they still all look different, right? I figured that his eyes look a bit more oval than usual and that's it, it didn't feel enough for me, so I started watching the new Trigon anime in between while the face up layers were drying, so I could understand the character and see how to adjust his face to fit Vash the best. Usually I don't mess with the franchises I'm not familiar with, so this experience helped me learn that apparently I can't draw a face up without understanding the character's personality. And because I didn't have this understanding from the beginning, I was adjusting his eyes on every layer until I figured out the right shape. I started watching the anime from the new adaptation, because that is the version of Vash I am making, but then I also watched a little bit from the old anime as well. So I have to say that the new adaptation gives a way better representation of his personality. The old anime goes more towards a classic shonen comedy anime, while the new one is centered more around Vash, his emotions and personality, and is more dramatic. Even though both versions of Vash are a bit goofy and nobody takes them seriously, with the new Vash you can tell that something is off, that behind his look he is hiding some deep sadness. Like for example when he is joining his future friends, you can see that sometimes Vash is spacing out and spends most time caught up on his own thoughts. I didn't notice anything like that in the old anime, and I think this wide spectrum of emotions the character got in the new adaptation makes him way more relatable for the viewer. But what is relevant for the face up, I understood that the main emotion on his face is sadness that comes from too much compassion. The world around him is too cruel and he takes everything to heart, even things he couldn't control. He is trying to help everyone but also is blaming himself thinking that he brings more trouble than he helps. He is very sincere and heartfelt. 
And I think it was also helpful to see his face from different angles because I make a 2D character into 3D. This was the first attempt to make his face up and personally even now I think the result wasn't too bad. I was quite happy with it until I removed the plastic wrap and realized that I accidentally over blushed his face with pastels and now the skin tone doesn't match. So I took acetone and started over. With my second face up I used minimum blush and constantly was comparing the skin tone with his neck. In general, I think the second face up turned out way cleaner than the first one because I already knew what to do and how to work with this mold and I think the face looks even more gentle and loving now. Next I'm going to paint his scars and implants and blush his body just a little bit. Usually I avoid body blush because I'm afraid it will get damaged on the joints and look like a mess, but here most of the work goes into his torso and will be safe no matter how you pose him. Unless you guys want to rub his six pack every day, in that case it won't last long of course.
The body is done now, but before I move on to the next thing, I would like to finish up his hair. For the rest of his hair, I am going to use synthetic doll hair and glue it with super glue directly to the scalp. I showed this technique in the past when I was making a beard for my Karl Heisenberg doll and now I am choosing it again because it looks the most realistic and because it's a really good pick for doll heads with this gap we get after removing molded hair. The only negative thing I can say about this technique is that you really need extreme amount of patience and time to finish this job. To be honest, I didn't finish even half of his head as I started to regret I didn't just cover the gap with epoxy and used normal flock. It would be so much easier and faster. But once started, I had no way back, so I had to continue gluing these hairs bit by bit. The idea is to glue hair vertically in small bundles to the head and then trim them as soon as the glue dries. It's important to work in small locks because the bigger the bundle, the harder it is to trim. And if you need to apply too much force, scissors might rip them out again. The most important thing to keep in mind before you start gluing is you need to make sure that the hair bundle has a straight cut and all hairs are in line. Otherwise it won't stick to the head. So first I apply glue, then I take a hair lock, trim the end I want to glue, apply it to the head, hold for a few seconds until the glue gets a good grip, and then I trim it from the top to my desired length. In this case I only left about 2mm because the character has a side cut, but I think it can work for a bit longer hair cuts as well, or you can also cut them in gradient. And a few days later I ended up with this coconut. What do you think? Was it worth the effort? <laughs> now we can give him a nice haircut. Interesting fact about Vash is that he is not actually a human, but a human-like power plant. And the color of his hair indicates how much power he has left. His original hair color is blonde, but when he uses his superhuman powers, he runs out of energy and his hair starts getting darker. So just from the new design of Vash, we can tell that he went through some serious challenges recently. Next up is my favorite part of this project and it's his prosthetic arm. They gave it a really interesting design in the anime. The arm seem to be made of some glass-like material and looks skeletal because of these two bone-looking elements. I am looking forward to sculpting this, but have to act very carefully to not damage the joints, especially in his wrist. Thank you. 
When you sculpt over wire, I'm not sure it's extremely important to make sure that there is no empty spaces between your sculpting material and wires, because they would make the sculpt more fragile, epoxy might crack and just slide down from the wires. Just to be safe, I prefer to work in several layers. I apply the first layer of epoxy sculpt pretty rough just to cover the wires and after it cures I carve it and add more material to bring it to the right shape. Usually when we start shaping epoxy sculpt on wires directly, it stretches out, starts spinning around the wires and of course it makes it really hard to achieve the right shape and avoid these cavities. The shape of the arm looks a lot like crystal with all these straight lines and clear sharp angles. And this form is really hard to sculpt because sculpting material is soft and gives more rounded results. Even if you try shape it with flat tools, it's almost impossible to get a smooth edge from just sculpting it. So I suggest to sculpt these details a bit bulkier than needed and then carve them with a knife. Sometimes it's a bit challenging to predict how much epoxy you will need at certain spots to have enough material to carve the shape you want, but even if you guessed wrong, you can always add more material later on. With this arm, I really had to take my time and carve and sculpt over it and carve again several times, because the shape is quite complex and because I think the arm is the main detail of his entire image. When working in layers, I don't usually wait for every layer to cure completely. Usually I wait like 6 hours before I get back to it. After 6 hours, epoxy sculpt is sturdy enough to keep its shape, but it's still quite soft, which makes it easy to carve. I think even if you are a beginner artist, you can get a decent sculpt if you just carve and add material enough times. Epoxy sculpt allows to carve and sand it and freshly mixed epoxy sticks well to a already cured one. If you blend it carefully, nobody will ever know that you adjusted it somehow. You don't have to sculpt the entire thing in one go. Because of this layering stuff, for me sculpting of his arm alone got stretched over two weeks. In general, this was the most long running project of mine, because I started it in January and only just finished the doll in May. My original plan was to spend three to four weeks from start to finish, but all of the sculpting and painting drawbacks made it impossible to finish him fast. Projects like this make me really wonder if buying a 3D printer and learning 3D sculpting would be a better time investment. It would make my life so much easier and allow me to pop content more regularly, but I keep holding on to hand sculpting because I think handwork has more charm to it and makes my projects more unique because nobody, even I, can recreate these details exactly to the form it was created, while a 3D printer can pop unlimited amount of items. Also, as a content creator, I feel like it's a good idea to show doll customizing as an accessible hobby. Not everyone has or can afford a 3D printer, but most people can buy a jar of epoxy sculpt, right? I wonder what's your opinion on hand sculpting, guys? Does it feel more special to you or should I really move towards technological advances? <laughs>
with the arm not everything worked out from the first try either. At first I wanted to use metallic paints to achieve that gloss, so as usual I decided to first paint reflections on the arm with high contrast and then cover everything with turquoise metallic paint. But I think metallic paint had too good coverage and blended all of the shadows and reflections. I decided to add more dimension to it by adding a darker wash over it and when I wanted to wipe it off his palm, the metallic paint came off as well. I didn't want to go back and apply another layer of metallic because using too much paint would destroy the fine sculpting, especially considering that now I have more paint in the gaps, if it makes sense. So. I decided to wipe all of the paint job and start over. While I was desperately trying to remove all traces of paint from my sculpt, I broke his fingers and a boxy sculpt just started chipping off his hand. Emotionally, <laughs> emotionally I took it very hard because I wasn't happy with the paint job and didn't know how to fix it and then the epoxy sculpt started chipping off and at that moment I felt like the entire arm was falling apart. I didn't film that because I wanted to throw this project out of my window, luckily I didn't do that, instead I put my work aside and let my steam out in PAL world instead. So I was neglecting his arm for another month until I got the courage to look at it again and find out that it wasn't that bad at all. The first thing I did was crush testing the rest of the sculpt and even with much force applied other elements neither cracked nor chipped off. So I decided to turn this fail into an opportunity to improve my sculpt overall as well because now I had a new set of files that allowed me to send small details even more precisely. After I was done sanding and scratching all the paint left over, I went back to the palm and checked it for potential weaknesses. I realized that the old sculpt was too thin to survive being submerged in pure alcohol and furiously rubbed with a toothpick, especially because I was sculpting on vinyl and it's flexible. When I thought that this sculpt was a complete failure, I thought that epoxy chipped off because vinyl is too smooth and epoxy didn't get enough grip on it. However, if it was true, the fingertips would fall off as well and easily. In my crash test, I put them with force and they had a death grip though. Then I thought, how are they different from the rest of the finger? And I realized that the fingertips are easily reachable for me to sculpt, so I applied an even layer of epoxy all around the finger, while the fingers themselves consisted of separate plates and there was little to none epoxy on the sides, if it makes sense. I could cut off the fingers, stick in some wires and sculpt them from scratch, but I decided that it will be enough to just shave some vinyl from the fingers and make sure the entire finger is a one solid sculpt. I think this solution is better because wires are also flexible and wouldn't give much improvement in flexibility, but unlike vinyl they are also slippery, so if sculpt cracks a finger would just slide down from the wire. Crash test showed that this is not the case with vinyl though, and I think it's a huge advantage. Leaving some material from his factory palm also helps to control the length of his fingers and it makes the job way easier. Look, in my second sculpt I start off with sculpting the joints, but I make them go along the finger as well, so there won't be a crack between the finger plates this time. The new hand turned out just a tiny bit bigger, but it's so so much stronger now. While this project was on pause, I did some research in miniature painting just to find the best way to paint the arm for it to look as close as possible to the anime. So I just looked up how people paint gems and metals to adopt some of their techniques for my needs. I started off with dry brushing just to define the highlights and then I tried to use a technique people call glazing. It's when you use several shades of acrylic paint and apply it in very thin layers almost like watercolor and then with layering the paint you get a really smooth gradient. 
For this technique, I needed to mix turquoise, green, black and white in different proportions to get more complex shades. And this technique takes a lot of time. Acrylic paint dries too fast for it, so here I definitely needed a wet palette that helps to keep paint wet longer. You can either buy one or you can save yourself some coin and make your own. To make a wet palette I used an old plate, filled it with kitchen paper and made it soaking wet. Then I covered it with one sheet of baking paper and my wet palette was done. Feel free to use this trick for your miniature painting as well. With this palette the paint stayed wet for several hours and the thicker puddles were good to work with even the next day.
I like to work in mixed techniques and switch them according to my needs. For example, for the arm itself it was easier and safer to use glazing, but on the hand the details are so tiny you can easily treat them like painting and blend the paint directly on the figurine. I also use dry brushing and wash. Here's what the finished paint job looks like. It was a bit hard to decide on where the light source was, because the arm itself also has glowing elements. I decided for myself that the main light source comes from the top and a bit from the front. In the anime the arm looks like glass, and I tried to keep in mind how light breaks down when it hits through the glass, especially on the thin elements, like bones. And for the shiny finish I used the spray top coat from Mr. Hobby. Don't know about you guys, but I think this technique was really worth the effort. I think the arm looks much better now. As a final touch, I'll just paint the glowing elements with glowing in the dark paint and the arm will be done. Now we can finally move on to the outfit. 
I'd like to start with his pullover and joggers because it is the first layer and we will need to keep it in mind while working on the other layers. I have patterns for a regular short and pants but pullover and joggers will be made of elastic fabrics and we need to make up for its elasticity. I have this monster high t-shirt in stock and look how thinner it is compared to the regular short pattern. I decided to not reinvent the bicycle again and just copy the pattern from this factory t-shirt. I didn't have the same luxury with the pants though, so I had to decrease the basic pattern I had. For this I need to add some material along the crotch, but remove more from the side seams. Every fabric has different elasticity, so it's always important to make a test sample and check how your pattern fits. I was lucky my pants fit from the first try, but with the short I had to make two prototypes before it fit properly. Next up is his jacket. I have this strange coat pattern from my Carl Heisenberg doll and I'm going to use it as a base. It already has an allowance I added to make up for the thickness of a shirt, but Vash has an oversized jacket with lining, so I need to add even more material to make up for it as well. Then I need to build a pattern for the hood. I don't know how to make a hood for a doll, but I know how to make one for a human. So I tried to follow the same steps, but change allowances according to the scale and also just eyeballing some stuff hoping it would fit. I measured the doll's head circumference and the height of his head from the neckline. Now I need to build a mesh for the blueprint. I start with a vertical line. The length equals the height of his head and neck, plus approximately one third of this measurement. In my case, it was about 17 mm. Then I measure the length of the neck hole on the back of his jacket. For me, it is 3 cm. So the next vertical line will go 3 cm left from the initial one. This will be the back of his head. Then I divide the circumference of his head by 2 and add about 1 fourth of this length as an allowance. I made it 1.5 cm. This will be the width of our hood. Afterwards I copied the neck hole from the front of his jacket on my blueprint as I am showing in the video. And then drew the rest of the hood intuitively using the guidelines we got now. 
This reminds me of the meme how to draw an owl. Draw a circle, then draw the rest of the owl. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> The size of the dot on the hood equals the difference between the neckline of your hood and the neck hole of the jacket. This will be the basic pattern for a hood. Now I need to adjust it for the model. On the pictures we see that Vash's hood has a stand-up collar and a placket. That is a separate piece. So I need to cut off the placket and draw a new collar. Then I quickly made a mock-up to see how the pattern works. Let's start with adjusting the hood. I think it would not look too bad at all if the doll would wear it properly on his head. But in my case it's more important to make a hood that looks good when it's down. The fabric I'm going to use is very stiff and it won't shape itself nicely, so I have to adjust the pattern for a different reality. I certainly need to make the hood wider towards the face and also make it a bit shorter. I also didn't like the way his sleeve was sitting. In oversized jackets the shoulder is usually way longer than our anatomical one and in these cases it makes more sense to make the head of the sleeve more flat. And I'll also increase the depth of the armhole and change its shape closer to a slit armhole. This would be my second mock-up. I made the sleeve shorter to not waste the fabric, but check out how much better the sleeve sits now. The hood is still not laying properly though. I decided to increase the forehead dots to remove some material. You can see that with these adjustments it is hard to wear the hood on the doll now, but what you gonna do have to choose right priorities. I also need to make sure the collar of the hood makes a straight line with the closure. So I'm adding some material to the corner of the collar as well to make up for it being put to the back. The new sleeve looked good indeed, but how will it work together with the prosthetic arm? I think here we definitely need a more fitted sleeve, so it seems like for the best result we need to make an asymmetrical pattern. 
For his right arm, I will keep this nice oversized sleeve I got, but for the prosthetic arm, I will make a more fitted armhole and sleeve. Now we can make the final version of the jacket. I cut the details out of the main fabric with seam allowances, but I left bigger allowances along his waistline, because here will be a fold. And also along the bottom of the jacket and around his face on the hood, so that the lining won't be sticking out. The pattern for the lining is pretty much based on the main jacket, but there is a few nuances we need to keep in mind. The main rule is that the lining should not pull the main fabric and deform the jacket as we wear it and move in it. First of all, the armhole of the lining has to be shorter than the main fabric, so when we build them together, the seam allowance of the main fabric won't push the linings up. I think it's extremely important to do this in doll clothes, because in this scale even tiny allowances are huge. I only left a few millimeter allowance around the face, because a big allowance from the main fabric will make up for it. Along the bottom, however, I left a normal allowance, because here I need the lining to be long enough to create a fold along the bottom. This extra fabric is very important in human clothing, because it helps to prevent the lining from pulling the jacket up in motion. So even though I left a big allowance along the bottom, the lining has to be just a little bit shorter, enough to not stick out of the jacket. I also added a fold in the middle of the back lining that we usually make in human clothing to make it more loose, but I think in doll clothing I could really just skip this step. I think this was not necessary, but it also didn't hurt. So basically, if you want to make the lining right, you need to make sure it will not intervene with the main fabric.
Here's what the jacket looks like when it's almost done. I fixed the folds on the main material along the bottom and around the hood with an additional seam as well to make the jacket keep form. This fabric has a rubbery coating so it doesn't fold that well with just ironing, partly because you can't apply high enough temperatures without melting the entire thing. I also gathered the short sleeve that goes under the prosthetic arm to make it easier to wear and of course stitched together the allowances of the lining and main fabric around the armhole, just to make sure the lining doesn't move under the jacket. Now I only need to add some decorative elements like project seeds patches and the metal collar plate. For the patches I used a normal brown fabric and painted the embroidery on it with acrylic paint for textiles and glued them with all-purpose glue directly to the jacket. The metal collar plate I made of epoxy sculpt, painted it silver and attached it to the jacket using the same glue. And the jacket is done! Next up are his shoes. My original plan was to customize the boots from cloth, but after I saw how nice the arm and jacket turned out, I figured it would be kinda cheap to use the factory shoes. Also, the boots from Claude are a bit loose on the top and it looks different from what Wersh has. This was a good enough reason for me to change my mind and challenge myself even more by making the new shoes from scratch. For the shoes I am going to use actual leather, even for the mock-up. For the first mock-up I just roughly connected leather pieces just to see how the pattern fits. Even though I was drawing this pattern directly on the doll, some mistakes still popped out when I used leather. First of all, lacing was not perfectly centered, so I adjusted it. The top of the shoe was not parallel to the floor, probably because the inner side of the shoe was too short, so I balanced this out as well. And the last thing I changed was not about fitting, but the shoe model itself. I decided to move this horizontal cut a bit lower because the frontal piece looked too large and I didn't like it. So this would be all the adjustments for now. Now let's cut out the details again and make a proper shoe. I start with shaving down all the seam allowances that I'm going to fold to the inside. The leather I am using is very soft, so I can just use scissors for this operation, just need to be careful to not make any holes. You can see how much thinner the seam allowances are now compared to the rest of the shoe. Now I am going to glue them to the inside using all-purpose glue. Shaving seam allowances like this will help us get smooth edges without additional bulk. If needed, we can flatten the seam allowances additionally by smacking them with a hammer. It has to be a rubber hammer though, because metal can damage leather. I don't have one, so I just gently slap the seams with the handle of my scissors instead.
As I mentioned before, this leather is very soft, so it needs additional support for the shoe to keep form. I made these slippers out of thermoplastic and going to glue them to the inside of my leather boots. Here's what I got so far, they start to look more like actual boots now. Next I need to make soles and my old friend Apoxy Sculpt is coming to the rescue again. I roughly sculpted them on the shoe and after Apoxy Sculpt cured, I just carve and sand them until they start looking like proper soles. The most challenging thing here is to make the soles balanced, so that the doll can stand straight without falling to the front or back. And they must have the same thickness as well, because we don't want one leg to end up longer than the other. After gluing the soles, I can finally add the decorative elements to the shoes. For them, I'm going to use different kind of leather, it's a bit more tough than the original one, but I still managed to thin it down with scissors. This tough leather gave me a blister, but I was so carried away I didn't even notice it until later. Here are the shoes all done, and I think they look really great, especially for my first self-made leather boots. I'll definitely experiment more with those shoes in the future. Next up is his revolver. At first I wanted to make it as one solid piece, but only until I found this 3D model and was like, OMG, what if I add a joint to my revolver as well? How cool would that be? So, without thinking twice, I decided to chop the wood blank I made earlier in half and add a joint. All deadlines I set up for myself were long failed anyway, so I didn't have much to lose. Still managed to ship the doll before I went on vacation, but I really had to jump on the last train with this one. Here we need to give props to my customer who was ready to wait for this doll as long as it takes me so I could actually take my time to think this project through and make it as polished as possible. Because of the size of this joint I will only be able to connect it with a wire and wires don't give enough friction, which means the joint will get quite loose over time. So for the revolver to not open on itself I also added a tiny magnet in it that will hold the barrel in place unless you decide to open it.
I'm going to paint the revolver with this paint from AK, it's called Extreme Metal in color steel. I find this paint really interesting because it consists of several shades of paint that has different density, so they don't mix completely, and you can get this very realistic steel-like color effect. To be honest with you, I expected it to be just another grey metallic paint until I started to paint this revolver. I surely mixed the paint properly, but I couldn't understand why I wasn't able to get an even layer of paint. It's only after I applied the second layer I looked at pictures of steel online and realized that someone actually put so much thought into designing this paint special for model painting. As something of a nerd myself, I appreciate things like this so much. I didn't use any other paint over it and look how nice the gun looks already. Such a nice and complex metal color. It's like a mix of metallic and matte paint in several shades of grey. Looks so pretty, I don't want to add anything to it. The gun is ready now, but it needs a holster, right? I'm going to make it out of the same leather I used for the boots. And the last accessory we need to make for him is his glasses. I was wondering what I could use for the glasses, looking online for some orange plastic sheets but couldn't find anything that would fit, until I went for groceries and noticed them. Orange flavored Tic Tacs. <laughs> One man's trash is another man's treasure, not just a snack but also an art supply. As a final touch, I also rub the temples of the glasses in laser just to make them a bit safer for the doll to wear. Now let's dress our doll and check out how everything looks together. I'm not only a doll artist, but also a content creator, and in every project I make for YouTube I try to make something new, test a different technique or maybe bring a new detail to make my videos interesting to watch and maybe inspire someone to think outside of the box and try something new as well. I am especially proud of this project because here we got a super cool prosthetic arm and tried a new painting technique on it, made a complex jacket with lining and a hood and a tiny revolver with a drawing in it. So many cool details in one project. I hope you enjoyed watching this video as much as I enjoyed making it and if you did, don't forget to give this video a like and subscribe to my channel if you are not subscribed yet. 
If you like, you can also support my channel further by buying me a coffee. All of the links you can find in the description box. For every 100 coffees I reach, I'll make a giveaway and the winner will get a custom doll commission. Each coffee equals one entry. Thank you very much for spending your time with me and I hope to see you soon in my next video. Bye!